Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. You know, as a pastor, I get asked a lot of questions, but that's probably not surprising to you. All kinds of questions about our church, about the Bible, about theology, and, and uh, about life. And I don't have all the answers, and that maybe surprises you as well. Maybe it doesn't. But I've noticed something about the kind of questions I get asked. There, there are some people who ask questions with a genuine desire to know. I remember a young lady who was asking questions after her grandfather had died about whether or not her grandfather could hear her in heaven just questions about prayer and about the afterlife. She had a deep desire to know. And then I've also been asked questions that maybe aren't really driven by the desire to know. They're, they really come from more of a place of wanting to oppose or to defend or to keep something at, you know, at arm's length. For example, I, I remember vividly a middle-aged man who reached out to me and said I, he wanted an appointment to meet with me because he said, I've got some questions I want you to answer. And I knew just from the tone, the way that he said that, that this was not something he wanted to know. He wanted me to know something based on his questions. So when we ask questions, we really should be asking ourselves, what's behind this? Do I have a desire to know? Or am I trying to defend or to you know, oppose something? In our series, Through Mark's Gospel, we're in a section on Jesus' life where he's being questioned. He's being questioned by the religious leaders of the day. And you're going to see that the questions he's being asked are not coming from a real desire to know, genuinely know who is God and is Jesus genuinely his divine son in, in the flesh. They're really being asked questions with an agenda to oppose him, to resist him. So I'm going to look at just a couple of these passages that uh, come up before our main passage for today. In last week in chapter 2, we, Pastor Brian taught us about the healing of the paralytic. And in chapter 2, the primary question being asked there is, who has authority to forgive sins? Jesus says your sins are forgiven, and they ask this question. Who does he think he is? Only God can forgive sins. So that's the question. And then in verses 13 through 17, Jesus calls a man named uh, Levi. He went out again to the beside of the sea, and the crowd was coming to him. He was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at a tax booth. He's a tax collector. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. So Jesus calls a tax collector. This, is not, th this was a traitor to the Jewish people. He's in league with Rome. And as he reclined at table in his house, that's Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? There's the next question. What's he doing with these people? Your master, Jesus, is eating and hanging out with all the wrong kinds of people. And by the way, this is one of the primary critiques of Jesus in his early ministry is he is inviting into his kingdom all the wrong kinds of people, not the religious morally pure, but all the sinners, the sinful, the outcasts. So there's the next question. In verses 18 through 22, we read these. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. That's John the Baptist. And people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your Jesus' disciples do not fast? And Jesus says this. This is interesting. Can wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth in an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old and the worst tear is made. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. Now, what's that all about? Well, just put it briefly, what he means there is that when he tells the story about the wedding guests, do you fast when the bridegroom is with you? I mean, can you imagine going to a wedding and you have a beautiful ceremony and then you go to the reception, you're ready for the banquet and the, and the dancing and the music and the toasts and the father of the bride gets up and he raises his glass and there's nothing in it, there's nothing in your glass and he says, friends, thanks for coming, but you'll notice there's no food. Neither is there any drink. We're going to be fasting today at the reception, and there's not going to be any music, and there's not going to be any dancing. In fact, we'd like you all to sit in silence at your table for the next two hours, because weddings are a solemn occasion. 
You think this is ridiculous. This is the weirdest wedding reception ever because weddings are meant to be joyous occasions. This is precisely Jesus' point. He calls his people, his followers, into a life of joy and fullness. And so he's, he's different, in other words. And that's just what he means when he says the wine and the wineskins. You don't pour new wine into old wineskins, otherwise they burst it. His point is this. You cannot fit the kingdom of God into your old categories. And you cannot fit Jesus into your old way of life. You need new categories and a whole new way of life. That's, that's kind of his point. So he's being asked these questions about why does he hang out with these people? Who does he think he is for giving sins? Why doesn't he fast? Why doesn't he follow the, the old way of doing things? And all of this sets up what's going to happen and what we're looking at here in the passage we're going to be examining uh, together today. So let's look at Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through Mark 3, verse 6. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him? And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand, and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out. And his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out immediately and held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Okay, now, at first reading, I'll freely admit that when we first read through this text, uh, it, it sounds like it doesn't have much practical relevance for us. I mean, they're walking through a grain field, they eat some grain heads, there's a guy with withered hands in a synagogue. What does this have to do with our lives? And, and frankly, why is this important for us at all? What does that have to do with Jesus being questioned? And what does that have to do with me? Well, one of the hints we get is in the very last verse. If you see here, this last verse, he, he, the Pharisees went out and held counsel with the Herodians against how to, him how to destroy him. Does that strike you as odd? Doesn't that sound like a little bit of an overreaction? I mean, think about it. Apparently some guys are doing something they shouldn't do in a grain field, and a man's in a synagogue with a withered hand, and we got to kill Jesus for this. What? What's going on here? Well, there's obviously something happening here that's more significant than we might immediately recognize. And interestingly, these two groups, the Pharisees and the uh, Herodians, these two groups had nothing to do with each other. They hated each other in the first century. For those of you that might, this might be new for you, the Herodians were, these are secular political progressives. They're in league with the, Herod, the Herodian dynasty, which are puppet kings under Rome's rule. They're Hellenistic Jews. They're progressive, secular. They support paganism and Greek worldview. These were not moral religious conservatives at all. The Pharisees were the other end of the spectrum. They were on the far right, morally, religiously, and politically. They're ultra conservatives, serious about the law, keeping the moral law as the way to stay pure. These two groups were diametrically opposed to each other, would never associate with each other, and thought the other person was the problem in the culture. Until what? They met Jesus. And they aligned because they saw him. They both saw him as a serious threat and someone to be dealt with, to be eliminated. Here's, here's maybe the point to take from that. The gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't fit neatly into our right and left categories, our conservative or, or, or progressive uh, liberal categories. In fact, the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we understand it, should be offensive and a challenge to both sides of the spectrum uh, in our culture and in that culture. 
So obviously there's a lot more happening here than we might initially understand. The first thing we're going to talk about is what comes up in here is the kingdom confrontation. We saw it earlier when Jesus questioned about fasting, when he's questioned about forgiveness, when he's questioned about Sabbath law, a kingdom confrontation. Here in this passage, there's two incidents that both involve the Sabbath, and they're linked together because both of them deal with Jesus' claims to authority. And there's a clash of kingdoms, really a clash of ideologies, of worldviews. And I would put it this way. The clash of kingdoms is a clash between religion and the gospel. And we'll be talking about that as we go. Note here, Jesus chooses this conflict. I think sometimes when we read through the New Testament and we read these stories about Jesus getting into conflict with the Pharisees, it's like, oh, these, these Pharisees are so mean to Jesus, he can't get away from them. They're always picking on him. They're always picking a fight. They're always, you know, antagonizing him. But Jesus is intentionally stepping into this conflict. He's choosing it for a reason. Uh, it doesn't just happen you know, accidentally to him or something that he can't get out of. That happens to me, maybe to you all the time. I find myself in situations where debates or struggles that I didn't mean to get into and I can't get out of. Maybe you've had that experience with COVID, debating about policies or political ideologies or you know, all kinds of things. We get ourselves entangled in discussions we don't mean to get into. That never happens to Jesus. He's intentionally stepping into these questions and these conflicts for a reason, to reveal something about who he is, to reveal his gospel and his authority as king. Okay, so let's look at uh, Mark 2, 23 and 24, and 3, 1 through 2. One Sabbath, he's going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. Now, pause there. Why would they be doing this, plucking heads of grain on the Sabbath? Why would this be a big deal? Well, they, they, the Pharisees are going to accuse them of, of harvesting, plucking heads of grain, working on the Sabbath, breaking the Sabbath law because they're working. We'll come back to that in a minute. But they would probably not be doing this unless they either had their master Jesus okay or they'd seen him do it as well before. And the Pharisees, oh, go back there for a minute. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And then in Mark 3, 1 through 2, again, he entered the synagogue and a man was there with a withered hand and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath that they might accuse him. I find this fascinating. They're, the Pharisees are watching Jesus to see if he's going to heal. They're not watching to see if he's going to heal because they want to see God miraculously restore a man. They want to accuse Jesus. In fact, Pastor Brian and I were talking about this in our preaching team meeting this week, and he suggested that it's possible this man with a withered hand was a plant by the Pharisees to trap Jesus, to see if he would indeed do it. We don't know that. That's inferring something that might not be there. But it is interesting that they are there for one reason, to watch him and to trap him, not to meet God, not to worship, not to see the miracle and the blessing of God in person. And, you know, I, honestly, I think that's true for us sometimes. You can be in the presence of God. You can come to worship. You can come to a worship service. You could be right here, right now, listening with all the skeptical voices in your head, with all the, the defense mechanisms, all the questions that really aren't opening yourself up to the truth of who God is in Christ, but wanting to oppose, wanting to resist, wanting to dissect and, and deconstruct and explain it away. That's really an issue of our own heart. The fundamental issue here is not really about Sabbath law. Not, not really. The core issue is, how does a man or woman, how does a person get set right with God? How does a person become right with God, restored, healed in their soul? This is the issue between what I would call human religion and the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's all over these two stories. That's the conflict of two kingdoms. Most people in the world, in my, in my observation, most people in the world, if they believe God exists, and not all do, of course, but if they do, they think you, you relate to him by trying to be good. Whatever good is on different terms, but basically you, you relate to God by trying to keep the law, by obeying his commands, by doing your religious duty, by being a quote-unquote good person. And there are lots of different overlapping definitions of what in our culture or different religious systems, how they define a good person. But... And, and really, there's a thousand variations of this. There's, there's, there's nationalistic variations of this. You, you relate to God by being a good citizen, by being a patriot. 
There's spiritualistic versions of this, by, you know, by, by meditating and by praying and by looking inside. There's, there's uh, you know, moralistic versions of this, that you avoid all the bad things, and that's how you're a good person. There's a thousand and one human variations on the same principle. I relate to God by being good. Jesus, however, comes on the scene and says, there's only one who's good, and it's me. So what does that mean for us? You know, join this group, obey these rules, pray these prayers, do these things, and you're accepted. Religion says, I obey, and I'm good, therefore I am accepted, or acceptable. The gospel says, I am accepted in my brokenness, in my badness, and therefore, because I'm accepted, I begin to obey. And there, there's all the difference in the world. In my experience, most people who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ do so because they think it's another version of human religion. It's another take on the same old thing. And they kind of think, I've been there, I've done that, I don't need more religion in my life, I'm skeptical of religion. Humans are always propping up some institutionalized religion that, that harms people or weighs them down. I don't need another one, whether you put Jesus' name on it or not. I would say to you, you're right. You don't need another religion. You don't need another propped up human idea of how to try to be good. But that's not what the gospel is. So don't, if that's you, don't reject something you don't really understand. Because that's not at all what the gospel is, which is the primary thing these passages are showing us. Notice in verse 2, the Pharisees watched Jesus to see whether he would heal this guy so they might accuse him. They want to see a, a healing. That's interesting to me. They want to see a healing, but not to praise God, but not to worship, but not to see a man restored, not to bring God glory. So, ah, so we can trap him. Their religion, their religious rules is getting in the way of seeing God do something amazing. How sad if that's us, if that's me. If my rule-following religious religion, my need to prove myself, could actually blind me to what God actually wants to do. And so this brings us to the next section, cross-examination. So there's a, a, a kingdom conflict, then there's a, 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 a cross-examination, meaning Jesus turns it back on them. And he's always doing this in the Gospels. He's being questioned, we've talked about that, but he's frequently turning those questions around and asking questions of them. And I think whenever we see this, whenever you see Jesus asking questions of the Pharisees or those who confront him, we should be asking ourselves, what does that question as well. In fact, if you're a journaler, maybe you have one of the Mark journals from this series with you, this is a great thing to do to take notes on, to underline, is when you see Jesus asking questions, ask that question of yourself. Here's what he does. Jesus, by the way, is not, he's not so easy to trap. Um, uh, he chose this confrontation. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, Jesus, speaking of the healing of the man with the withered hand, he, could have, he, he had options here. He could have healed this guy quietly. He could have just looked at him and winked and been healed. He could have waited until after the synagogue service was over and done it outside. He could have done it in his home. He could have not healed him at all. He didn't have to do it this way. But he chose this moment. He chose the public setting of the synagogue service with the religious leaders present intentionally to show something about his identity and his authority. All right, let's look at verses 25 through 26 and verses, chapter 3, verse 4. And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and he was hungry? And how he and those were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. I love this phrase, have you never read? <laughs> He's talking to the religious experts of the day, the, the, most, the most educated people in the law of God in the land, the Pharisees, the scribes, the teachers of the law, those who were the religious elite. And he says, essentially, you haven't read your Bible? Don't you know this story? Now, notice, he does not even engage with them at all in their particular debates. They, they, the, the Pharisees, and by the way, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, uh, we find out that this, it's actually lawful for them to do what they're doing. That it, was, it was according to Deuteronomy 23, verse 25, it was lawful for you to walk through someone's grain field and pick a few kernels if you're hungry to eat. What you couldn't do was take a sickle and harvest a bunch for yourself. That makes sense. Jesus says, so they're following the law, but the Pharisees had added a whole bunch of stuff to the law of God, the code, Levitical code, the, the law of Moses, to, uh, to, to, for this reason, to make sure people didn't break the law. They added more law more burdens, to make sure you didn't 
work on the Sabbath unintentionally. The Pharisees uh, had 39 Sabbath restrictions. They forbade the following activities, writing, erasing, and tearing, conducting business transactions, shopping, cooking, baking, or kindling a fire, gardening, doing laundry, carrying anything for more than six feet in a public area, moving anything with your hand, what? Even indirectly, with a broom, a broken bowl, flowers in a vase, candles on a table, raw food, a rock, a button that has fallen off. You could move things with your elbow or with your breath, but not your hand. This is crazy. What, what can you move with your breath? That seems like more work to me than just grabbing it with your hand. And this is just a partial list. It got to be ridiculous, which is kind of Jesus' point. But the reason they did this was to build like a, a boundary around, we don't want to break the law, so let's add a bunch of things to make sure we don't even come close to it. And they're missing the point entirely. I mean, this is a quintessential story of missing the point. It's kind of humor, humorous to me how Jesus says to them, haven't you ever read the Bible? How offensive it must have been to them. And he refers to the story about David, which is a little bit obscure in 1 Samuel 21. Here's his point. David was the, mess, the king of which Jesus is in the line of David. He's the true king of Israel. David and his men are hungry. They're starving. They come into the temple and they eat the bread, which is not lawful to eat. The point, though, is that they're starving. The law should not... If people starve and suffer because of law-keeping, there's a problem, Jesus says. And he's also saying that he has authority over all of these things. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not just different from religion. It's opposed to it. It's diametrically opposed to it. The gospel is not a new version or a new take on human religion. Not, not at all. Timothy Keller says this, Jesus did not come to reform human religion, but to end it, to put an end to it, and to replace it with himself. Jesus did not come to reform it, to, to clean it up, to give us a new version of human religion, but to put an end to it entirely. Have you ever, have you ever thought about that for a minute? Just, just stop and think about that. Jesus is the end of religion. Let that sink in for a minute. He's not interested in more religious rules. He's not interested in loading you down with more stuff you have to do. My guess is, if you're like me, you've got a long to-do list. Actually, one maybe in your notebook or on your phone, or in your, certainly in your mind, in your heart. Stuff I ought to be doing, stuff I should stop doing, stuff I haven't gotten done, stuff I haven't gotten to, things about me that I should improve. I ought to, I should, I need to. We're all walking around with this burden of shoulds. Jesus did not come to, you know, reform human religion, but to end it and to replace it with himself. This is the gospel. He meets all of the requirements. He checks all the boxes because he knows you can't. I can't. He does that and invites us then into a relationship with him who has fulfilled it perfectly. This brings us to the king's declaration. The king's declaration. The statement and claim that Jesus makes at the very end of chapter 2 is vitally important for us, for those of us who want to follow him. He says something that's it's easy to pass by, but it's so, so important. It's astounding, really. Let's read it. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. There's so much in this simple statement, in, these, in this, 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 this one sentence here. How is the law meant to function in the life of the believer? If it's true that the Bible contains rules and a moral code, and it does, but it's also true that religion is, is loading people down with rules they can't follow and the gospel is to set us free, then what's the point of the law? What is the point of the moral code in here? And that's what Jesus is getting at with this simple statement. The Sabbath, the, which is part of the Ten Commandments, keeping this, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy, was meant to be a gift to humanity, a blessing to people, a day of rest, of enjoyment of God, of focusing on His love and His mercy and His blessings in our lives, and to be with those that we love and that love us and that love Him, a day of praise and worship, a day set aside just to enjoy God, a gift to us. It had become an impossible law to keep, as we just talked about a moment ago. And so ask this yourself this question. Is the law of God to me a burden because I feel like I can't keep it? Or is it a blessing because I know Jesus has perfectly kept it and invites me into a path of life and joy? 
The law of God is meant to be the demonstration of a path of life and joy because you already are accepted, not a burden that you can't keep. So that's a simple question for us. When you think about God's law, do you feel it as a burden or a blessing? If I'm honest, sometimes I think of it as a burden. Sometimes in my, in my humanity and in my sinfulness, I start slipping into thinking about all the things that I haven't done, that I can't do, that I screw up. Maybe that's you. Jesus is saying in this simple sentence, the Sabbath was made for man. If something's made for you, it's a gift. It's given to you. If you are made for something, then you're obligated to it. You're under it. And that's not what the law is for those that are in Christ. It's meant to bless you. You, not you being made to serve it. And there's a popular phrase, I've even heard a song with this title, you are made for this. Made for this? People use hashtag made for this. Well, according to the gospel, what are you made for? What am I made for? What is it exactly? I'm made for a relationship with the one who made me. I'm made to live in joyful, humble obedience and, 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 and freedom of following the king. That's what I'm made for. Anything else is religion and law. Even if I'm trying to make it up myself, the DIY spirituality, my own version of what's true, that's, I'm following my own code. I don't know about you, but I don't need the Bible to give me rules that I can't keep. I've got my own expectations that I can't even keep. Maybe you've got yours as well. According to scripture, we're made to follow the king, to be liberated by him, to be loved by him, to be set free by him. In verse 28, this is an astounding claim. So the Son of Man, this is a divine claim coming out of the book of Daniel, Jesus referring to himself, is Lord even of the Sabbath. He's saying he's Lord and he's the source. Jesus does not tell us where to find rest or how to find rest. He doesn't say, you know, do these six things, follow these three principles, obey these ten rules, and you will have rest. He invites us to himself because he is rest. This is what he says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. He says, come unto me, all you who weary and who labor, and I will give you rest. Not I'll show you or I'll teach you or I'll point you in the right direction. I'm it. Rest in him. That's what he means when he says he's the Lord of the Sabbath. This is what Augustine famously said in his confessions, which has been quoted a thousand times, but I love the quote. He says, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. God says, I've, I've made you for me, and you will be restless. You will be living under uh, oppressive burdens, even those of your own making, of your own uh, sense of you ought to be better than you are. It will crush you until you find your rest in me. This brings us finally to a kingdom demonstration. So Jesus, there's a, there's a confrontation. There's the cross-examination where he turns it back on them and asks questions of, of them and of us. And then he makes a declaration that he's Lord, Lord of all. And then to, to put an exclamation point on it, he demonstrates his lordship right in the synagogue on the very Sabbath day. This encounter in the synagogue in the beginning of chapter 3 is essentially a display. Of, it's, a, it's an answer to what Jesus says in verse 4. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do harm, to save life or to kill? It's an obvious. Anybody who's listening and honest knows what the answer is. But they were silent. The text tells us why. You know, sometimes when I read through the Gospels, the disciples are the ones who are confused. The Pharisees often know exactly what Jesus is saying. They just don't want to hear it. And I've been in both cases. I've been in both places. Maybe you have. There have been times in my life when I've been confused. I don't understand what you mean, Jesus. But there have been not many other times when I just don't want to hear it. I just don't want to acknowledge it. I just don't want to surrender. And that's precisely what's happening here. Look, look at verses 5 and 6. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. Can you, can you feel the tension in the room? He looks around. I mean, you've got to see it. Jesus is it's Sabbath day. He's in the synagogue. The Pharisees are there for one reason, to trap him. He knows that. He calls the man, come here. The man comes forward with his withered hand, and he looks around the room, scanning every eye, seeing into every heart. And he does that right now. I know you're watching this online, but Jesus sees you. He looks straight into your soul. He knows all things, and he's angry and full of grief at their hardness of heart. What's that about? 
he's angry because these people, these men, who are supposed to, they carry the name of God in the world. They're supposed to represent God and His goodness and His mercy and His love. And the truth is, their hearts are more shriveled and withered than the man's hand. They're the real issue in the room, and they don't see it. So he's angry with them because they're leading people astray and weighing people down with burdens they can't keep. And he's grieved because they don't see. Jesus came to heal both the man's hand and their hearts. The gospel of Jesus Christ can not only heal withered hands and put bodies back together, but even more, we saw last week of the paralytic, and we see right here, he wants to heal hearts and forgive sin if we'll surrender, if we'll humbly come before him. And that's what he's doing here in this story. So before we wrap this up, I just want to pause for a minute. And, and I think one of the great questions we should always be asking ourselves when we read a gospel account is, where am I in this story? Where, do I, where, where, do I, where would I place myself? Who would I relate to? Where do you find yourself in this story? And if you stop and think about it, there's really only two options. I mean, you're not Jesus, in case you're confused about that. I'm not him, and neither are you. There's only one Lord. There's only one Messiah, one Savior. There's only one King. There's, you're either the man with the shriveled hand or the Pharisees with shriveled hearts. Which are you today? So some part of your life that's broken and shameful and you try to hide and you can't fix on your own and you're, and you're in need of healing and you feel unworthy? Or are you arms crossed, defiant, hardened, skeptical, questioning in order to keep things at a distance? Are, we're either someone with a shriveled hand that Jesus wants to heal or people with shriveled hearts that he wants to liberate and set free. And I love what he does. Notice what he does. He says to the man, stretch out your hand. That might not seem like a big deal, but think about this. Stretch out your hand, not just your arm, but your hand. What's the one thing someone with a withered, shriveled hand cannot do? They can't stretch it out. That's what he can't do. Jesus just says, stretch out your hand, and the man does. He's never been able to do that before, but what happens? Because it, at the voice of Jesus, at the word of God in Christ, he can. Remember back to week one, if you were with us, in week one we said when Jesus speaks, things happen. Ordinary people follow him, broken people are made whole, and troubled people are set free. Jesus says, stretch out your hand. Jesus says, get up and walk. Jesus says, go and leave your life of sin. And people do. Jesus says to you, you know, stop wallowing in your shame. Jesus says, forgive that person that's, that you've been harboring this anger toward all your life. Or forgive yourself for what you've done in the past. And we say, I can't, I can't. And Jesus says, I know. I know you can't. I can. That's the whole point of the story. I know you can't. I know you can't in your own strength forgive. I know you can't in your own strength make yourself better or get out of that pit of shame and depression and anxiety and fear. Jesus says, but I can. Will you listen to me? Will you come to me? I want to finish. Sinclair Ferguson says that the law allowed this man to enjoy the blessing of the Sabbath. The law makes it, makes it possible. It opens the door, but we can't keep the law. The law could not heal him. It could not restore him to his joyful condition for which he had been created. Only Jesus can do that. Only the king can do that. So we look at Jesus and he's being questioned by the religious leaders who totally miss who he is and what he's doing. And Jesus chooses intentional moments for these confrontations to reveal his gospel, his kingdom, and his identity. And I want to finish by asking a couple of questions. That I think these are, these are not just questions in, in theoretical sense. Friends, these are real choices we have to make. Here's the questions. Will we follow the king? Will we follow him by welcoming the outcasts and those who are not like us? Remember when Jesus calls Matthew Levi. Levi throws a party for all his messed up friends. And they come to his house, all the sinners, all the outcasts, all the wrong people. And Jesus shows up and sits down and, at the table with them. Table meant fellowship, acceptance. Will we follow Jesus by doing the same? Who, who are the people in, in your life and in my life that I don't want to associate with? I'm serious. If you've got a journal, write it down. I'll bet you know. Who are the people you don't want to associate with? Have you ever stopped to consider 
Those might be the very people Jesus wants you to go to and love. Second, will we follow the king by confronting the false religion in our own hearts and in the world? Jesus does this. He does this in profound uh, ways that, that are, he's not always just shaming people or he's not condemning them, but he's drawing the clear distinction between the gospel and human religion. Will we follow the king by confronting the false religion in our own hearts first and in the world? By pointing out the difference between the freedom and joy of following Jesus and the burden and the crushing weight of trying to measure up in our own strength. And third, will we follow the king by declaring that he alone is Lord? He alone is Lord. He says that the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. These are real choices for us. In a day and age where I think it's very, very tempting to just want to keep it private. You know, we, we're being conditioned not to talk about things all the time because we, we might get canceled. People might misunderstand. It might cause a rift. But if, if I'm a follower of the king, how could, how could I be silent about his love, his mercy, his grace? Declare that he alone is Lord. Friends, let's follow Jesus into welcoming and accepting people that are not like us, even those that we don't in, our, in ourselves even want to associate with, but Jesus does. Frankly, what, why would the Son of God, the King of the universe, want to associate with me? But he does. Let's follow the King by confronting the hardness of our own hearts, the false religion in our own hearts and in the world. Let's follow King Jesus by declaring that He alone is Lord. Let's pray together. Jesus, these stories, which sometimes can seem obscure to us and, uh, and hard to understand, as we spend time and settle in and focus our minds and hearts, you reveal to us who you are, just as you did in the first century you're doing right now in our own hearts, that you are king, and that you've come not to load us with more burdens that we can't keep and we can't bear, but to set us free. Praise you, Jesus, that you're Lord of the Sabbath, and in you and you alone we find rest and freedom and joy. Help us to follow in your footsteps, welcoming people, accepting people, pursuing people, and pointing out to them the freedom and joy found only in the truth of your gospel. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Jeff. What a great message for us to be hearing in this day and age. Um, I want to circle back to the questions that, that Jeff finished the sermon with today. I'm going to copy and paste those in the comments section for you guys, for your own journals and to pray about throughout the day. But as we end today, I wanna, I wanna ask those again and circle back on those. So church, as we leave today, as we continue out through this week, will we follow the King by welcoming the outcasts and those who are not like us? And will we follow the King by confronting the false religion in our hearts and in the world? And church, will we follow the King by declaring that he alone is Lord. As we go out today, church, will we be a people to follow the King? Bless you. Have a great week. Thank you.